Hey, good morning. How are you guys doing? Has anybody here been down to see the marathon already? Two. Great. <laughs> the rest of you are like, 11 a.m., lying. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to be preaching the uh, next part of our Transforming for Good series in Nehemiah. If you have a Bible with you, please turn to Nehemiah 8. We've got four verses, just 8, um, 9 to 12. I'll tell you straight up, they're really interesting and peculiar verses. Before we read them, um, just context, last time that Joel spoke, he spoke about Ezra just standing up in front of a group of people, opening up a Bible. Phil, can I have your Bible quickly? And reading for six hours, and all the people just, A, just listened for six, six hours, but they wept. And now we're going to pick up the story in Nehemiah 8, verse 9, where he pretty much just says, stop weeping, the joy of the Lord is your strength, go and have some food and drink. So that's our verses today. <laughs> Let's read it together, shall we? Nehemiah 8, 9 to 12. I'll read it out. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, the gov, and Ezra, the priest and the scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet wine. And send portions to anyone who has nothing ready for the day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, hey, be quiet. This day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing. Because they had had understood the words that were declared to them. Um, let me just pray. We need God, God's help to understand this. God, thank you that your word is alive, living, and active. And I pray this morning you would speak to us um, through the word of God. Amen. Amen. Well, we're actually looking this morning at the theme of joy. Of joy. They made great celebration. We're looking at the theme of just what it is to be joyful. Um, so I've got three points on joy. We, we haven't got loads of time. I'm going to be quick, and then we're going to have some time at the end just to respond and have communion. Um, just as a macro kind of let's zoom out for a sec. What on earth's going on? Reading the law, Nehemiah, what is this transforming for good? Just quickly in, in 20 seconds, God said to Nehemiah, go and rebuild the walls of, of the city. You know, if, we, if Brian got knocked down and 400 years later, or how many years later, let's rebuild. There was once a great city here. We need to rebuild God's city. That's kind of what happened. And we're entering in the story where the walls have actually been finished. It's done. They rebuilt them. But now they're opening up and reading the word of God. And he said he read for six hours and the people wept. So just by way of introduction, why did they weep? Why did Ezra, the priest, read the Torah? The Torah is the first five books of the Bible, quickly. So I'll just quickly open up here. This bit here of your Bible is the Torah. It's the first five books. He got up and spoke for six hours. Why did they weep? As he was reading the word of God, as he was reading through the Torah, the law, it slowly dawned on them as a people just how far they had drifted from what God's commandments were. Suddenly, just revelation of how bad they had been. And as the words are spoken, this conviction comes into their hearts of like, man, we're not doing well. We're disobeying God's law, God's rules. And they began to weep. Conviction. The Holy Spirit goes into your heart and shows you something about God, shows you something about the Word of God, and convicts you. It doesn't often happen like everybody in the room is crying. I don't think we've had a morning here where everyone just starts crying um, all at once for six hours. Hallelujah. But it happens. It's the Holy Spirit. When was the last time you felt convicted of sin? Have you, have you experienced that? Just from reading the Bible or something that God has said to you, you just felt convicted. The people, the Israelites, they felt convicted as Ezra read the Torah. What did Ezra do? We read the bit, didn't we? He basically says to them, do not weep. Why would he do that? That seems really backwards. Isn't this a really good thing? You're realizing your sin and you're weeping because of it. Why did he say, do not weep? Is it because he's saying, don't be silly. You know, it's not that bad. You don't need to weep about it. It's only God. No, he's not saying that. He's saying something far more profound. 
the Israelites only saw how they had fallen short of the law. And because of that, they saw their sin. But Ezra saw something far greater than that. Not just how they've fallen short of the law, but behind the law is a gracious and good God. They thought primarily the way I relate and connect with God is through obedience to the law. But actually, primarily, before that, it's God's grace and goodness to us. They saw sin. Ezra's like, no, no, above that, he's a gracious and good God. And he says, the day is holy to the Lord. What does that mean? This day being holy. The day is holy to the Lord. This is the day that God has intervened. You see, the God who convicts of sin is also the God who saves sin. Amen? You see in the Word of God, this weeping because of sin, oh, I'm weeping, and this joy because of forgiveness, often hand in hand. This repenting of, I've done bad, I'm a bad person, I've fallen short, but celebrating in the goodness and grace of God, they're two sides of the same coin. And the coin is the grace and goodness of God. So we're going to learn about just joy, joy in who God is, not in just falling short, not just in looking at how bad we are, but joy in the gracious character of God this morning. So, that's just by way of introduction, three points. Number one is joy in repentance. I've got two points on this. Joy in repentance. Repentance is that what, when you've realized you've sinned, you've done bad, it's turning away and doing good. In that process, there's joy. Let me explain why. Number one, Jesus forgives and pays for our sin. I want us just to look at this in a horizontal, horizontal level before vertical. Um, I'm good friends with Phil here. Say if Phil did something really harsh towards me, he sinned against me. Uh, maybe he just made a joke, but you know there's an edge to it, and it was really embarrassed me in front of people, and his heart was bad in it. He hasn't done this, don't worry. When someone sins against you, it's personal, it hurts. And I'm, I want him to say sorry to me. In fact, I, f- I feel like I hold something against him. And I feel like actually I want him to sort of pay it back to me. He owes me something. Or maybe you sinned against someone else and you realize you've done wrong. You say sorry to them, but in some way you want to kind of make it back to them. You want to sort of pay it back somehow. Maybe just act a bit better behind them. Maybe just say a few words of encouragement. But when someone does something wrong against you, you expect there to be some kind of payment back. Some kind of like apology, but more than just apology, some kind of sign that you're really sorry. We pay for our sins. When we sin against God, God's a person. You sin against a person. It's the same with him. I don't sin against a machine. You know, I don't sin just against a, a, a set of rules. No, behind that is a person. When you choose to go your own way and to disobey God, you're not just breaking rules, you're, you're breaking God's heart. I don't mean in a sentimental way that God's just emotional and fragile, but like it's against a person. And because it's personal, he will feel someone must pay for that. But the good news is, point one, Jesus paid for our sins. So let's look at this. It says in uh, Matthew 26, 28, don't worry, it's not going to come up on the screen. Jesus says, my blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. And it says in 1 John 1, verse 2, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for ours, but also all the sins of the whole world. Um, By nature, we're not very good at taking responsibility for things that we do wrong. I just know that growing up with two brothers, someone kicks a football into the roses. Who did that? He did it. (laughs) No, he did it. We like to pass the buck, yeah? When it comes to our sins, Jesus, in saying these verses, is like, hey, for all of your sins, the buck stops with me. Father, instead of letting them pay for their sins, I will pay for them. I will pay for their sins. And so all these things that you've done wrong against God and this sense of like someone must pay for this, Jesus is stepping into that gap and saying, I will take the punishment. I will pay for them. So on the cross, Jesus became your sin. He became sin. And in that moment, when the father looks down at his son, he doesn't just see his perfect son anymore. He sees all of our sin, and it's like he's saying, I blame you. This is the truth of the gospel. This is what Jesus has done for us. And you know when someone sins against you, actually, it makes you angry, kind of rightly so. It's the same for the Father. 
And not just for one or two sins, like Phil telling me something wrong, like all of the sins of all the world, Jesus takes upon himself. And that anger the Father has, the Bible says he, he took out on Jesus this righteous, good anger. You know, it's not a wrong anger. He took out on his son, Jesus. And so Jesus there on the cross absorbed the wrath of God for our sin. Why? He's paying for our sins. He's paying the punishment for our sin. Why is that really significant when it comes to forgiveness? I'll tell you why. When you sin, you do something wrong, you repent, you come to God, your natural instinct is that you want to start paying God back somehow. You say, I'm really sorry, God, I'm sorry. And then you start to say things like, God, I'm, I'm really going to do well now this week, and I'm, I'm going to learn to read your Bible, I'm going to pray a bit better. What are you doing there? That's coming out of a heart of wanting just to pay back, to show that you're sorry. Jesus paid it. Maybe you say something like, God, I'll, I'll never do that again. You're making a promise of something you're not going to do because of what you did it. You're, you're trying to sort of pay back the wrong that you did. Jesus has paid it all. Jesus has paid all of it. So when God says, I forgive you, what he's actually saying is, you owe me nothing. You owe me nothing. Christ has paid for it. And the Christian life isn't one of some kind of like debtor's ethic. We just basically, God's paid for everything, and now we're in debt, and we spend the rest of our life trying to pay it back. No, Christ has paid it all. Grace means you receive forgiveness. You receive it. Yeah, we want to live right for him, but not from a heart of trying to obey him, trying to pay him back. He's paid for it. Amen? Amen. How do you, do you, do you do that? It's good to ask the question. When you're repenting, we're talking about repentance, is it a joy-filled repentance, or is it actually now I need to start paying God back? How does it look like for you? It's so subtle the way it creeps in. I'm not deter determined now to live for you. Jesus has paid it all. He says, you owe me nothing. Hallelujah. But the second thing Christ does, forgiveness, is I'll remember your sins no more. Jesus paid for our sins too, remembered no more. Not only does he choose, not only do we owe nothing, but he never brings it up. It's not like God's forgetful. No, no, he chooses not to bring it up. I don't know if somebody has really sinned against you, just a person, really hurt you and bothered you. And they've said sorry, and, you know, it's kind of all okay, and you talk, and it's sort of good. But inside, you're still hurting. And in your head, it still comes up. You know, I can't believe it did that to me. And you've sort of forgiven them, but inside, you're, you're not. And it's really easy to go back and think about things that have happened to you, things that have been done wrong to you, when Jesus paid for your sins, the promise of the Father is, I will remember them no more. It's like he's saying, I'm throwing it behind my shoulder. I'm never going to look backwards. I'm never going to bring it up. It's done. It's dealt with. And because of that, you only need to confess your sins when repentance once. Let me tell you a story. Um, when I was a teenager, I did something really wrong and stupid. I'm not going to tell you it is, and you don't really need to know. But it was... It was bad, and um, I was a young, young guy and wanted to grow in my walk with God, and I came to him in just tears of just, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, and I repented, and I felt him forgive me. It was wonderful, and I went on, and, you know, that week played its way out. Next week, you know, I come to church. It's time to worship. I'm lifting my hands, and as I'm worshiping, I began to think of what I did. I was like, oh, man. I just, I just sit down, and, oh, God, I'm so sorry I did that. I was really wrong, and I'm, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Will you forgive me? Yeah, yeah, great, okay. You move on. And later on that week, I'm going to spend some time in God with prayer, and I'm beginning to pray, and it just comes into my head again of how I let God down, of that thing I did a few weeks ago. I'm beginning to just, oh, oh, it's come up again. God, I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. And it was about the third or fourth time, I was literally in tears, um, and I just felt, I was just saying, God, please forgive me for that sin. And I almost felt him say, like, what sin? And he's like, you know, I choose to remember your sins no more. The first time you confess, it's dealt with, it's gone, it's thrown behind him. I'm coming to God with this big trouble. He's like, what? It's gone, it's dealt with, Christ has paid for it. I don't even know what you're talking about, son. <laughs> Remembered no more. Um, it's like, Someone in my small group described it like this once. We're talking about the way God forgives us. Um, it's like, you know, you have a file on your desktop, on your computer, 
Maybe you have a file on your desktop, a Word document or something. If you want to get rid of it, what do you do? You drag it to the waste paper basket, or you do command, shift, if you're on a Mac, you like your shortcuts. But you can put it in the waste paper basket, it's gone. Great, but you can still open up the waste paper basket and drag it out. You can still open it and look at it. When God forgives us, he doesn't just take it away. It's like he empties the re recycling basket. Yeah. It's gone. It's untraceable. So when you confess your sins to him, you know you've done wrong. You're repenting. It shouldn't just end in this place of I'm so bad. But actually you're trusting in Christ. He's taken it. It's gone. The Father's dealt completely with it. So when Jesus died on the cross, what were some of his last words? It is finished. It's gone. One sacrifice for all sins. No one here today needs to pay for their sins. Christ has paid for them. No one here today needs to worry about something they've already, already confessed to him. He's dealt with it. And so, on the back of this, joy and repentance. Just some quick how-tos for you. How to repent. We don't often talk about this. What is repentance? It's when you do something wrong. It's not just saying sorry, but it's turning away from it. So the promise in 1 John 1 verse 9, this is the promise of forgiveness. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For me, this is probably one of the most quoted verses in my prayer time. <laughs> if I confess, thank you God, he said, if I confess. The promise there is if you confess your sins, he is faithful to forgive them and cleanse you from unrighteousness. So here's a question. If God knows everything, when you sinned and he saw that you did it, why do you need to confess it? He knows that you did it. Confession is for your sake. Saying it out loud. Get it out. Name the thing. Don't hide it in shame. Has Jesus taken it or not? If he's taken it, the process of confession is, is getting it out. Saying it, and almost picture me just lumping it on Christ on the cross. So the first step of repentance is just confession. And just to say, um, this thing of weeping you know, when we go back to Nehemiah, they're weeping under how they've done badly in the law. Weeping actually isn't a bad thing. Weeping godly sorrow is actually healthy. It's a sign that you know, because it's a personal thing, you've let down a person, not a computer or just an algorithm, you've let down a person. Sorrow is actually quite natural, isn't it? And so a godly sorrow of just, oh, I've blown it. God, I've let you down. And even if it leads you to tears, that's not a bad thing. That's a healthy sign. But the Bible talks about having a worldly sorrow and just leaving it there. Just always moping and how bad your sins are. No, no, no. Godly sorrow is you come to Christ. You confess your sins and you ask him for forgiveness. How wonderful is this promise? It says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. There's never a case of, too bad, not going to forgive that one. No, he's faithful. If anybody's going to forgive, God's going to forgive. He's faithful to forgive your sins. Hallelujah. This is good news. Um, and he's just to do it. What does that mean, just? God forgiving your sin isn't like, oh, okay, it doesn't really matter. Good point. I'll forgive you. Let's just kind of sweep it under the rug. Not really a big deal. That's not justice. Give me a break. What kind of God's that? No, he, when he exercises forgiveness, he's punished his, his son, Jesus, in forgiving you, he's actually exercising justice. And because he's a just God, in forgiving you, he gets glory for being a just God. So in the process of forgiving you, God gets glory. Did you catch that? When you come to Christ and say, God, I've, I've sinned, I repent, you're trusting in him, you're actually glorifying him. That is an act of worship. You're saying, Jesus, your cross is enough for me. I confess this and you receive forgiveness. And God gets worship because you're trusting in the cross. If you're not doing that, what you're actually saying is your cross is good, but not good enough for my sin. It's dishonoring to the cross. Jesus' cross has dealt with all of our sins. So, Jesus paid for all of our sins. Jesus remembers them no more. How to repent. You confess your sin, and then you receive forgiveness through trusting in the cross. Don't be tempted to try and pay back. Receive it. I often like to think of it like a, a, a file on a desktop, whether it's a one megabyte file that's a Word document, or just, just a small thing. God, I confess it to you. 
Thank you, God. You've forgiven it. You've tossed it behind your shoulder. It's gone. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I don't have to pay you back. Or it's a five gigabyte massive file. Gone. No matter how big your sin is, no matter what you've done, it's gone. Just confess. He's faithful to forgive. Sometimes that process is like five to ten minutes. Um, I'll be honest with you. Last night, I was troubled with something in my spirit. I just felt a bit anxious about something. And I was like, Han, before I go to sleep, I just need to pray for a bit. So she went upstairs just to feed Zoe. And um, I just came before God. And, and, and within a few seconds of just praying, I was aware um, that the thing I was troubled about was actually some sin. I was actually, in it all, I was just being quite proud. That's what's causing me to be anxious. I was like, oh man, that's what it is. It's just my pride. And then it went to like, oh, God, I've been proud. Begin to dawn on me, like God hates pride. God, I'm so sorry. God, I, I'm, I've been proud in this situation. My goodness me, I've just all the things you've done for me, all of your goodness right now is just about me in this situation. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And as I come to the cross, what do I find? I find joy. I find a Savior who forgives me. That was a process of about 10 minutes. I got up from my couch upstairs just with a beam on my face. You know what? It's dealt with. Jesus has paid for that pride. I never have to confess that sin ever again. It's gone. It's in the past. That's a 5, 10 minute thing. Sometimes it's 5, 10 seconds. Sometimes you're just walking along the street or you just, you sin in your head something. And you're like, oh, oh man, I just shouldn't have thought that. In that in a few seconds, you have to get on the street and kneel down and cry. Just like, oh God, that was really silly. <laughs> You've got like, yeah, just get on your knees and go mental. I, I'm cy- sometimes I cycle to work and you just have a thought and it was sinful. In 10 seconds, I'm like, God, I just bring that to you. I confess that pride, whatever it was. Um, God, please forgive me. Thank you, Jesus. It's gone. 10 seconds later, just carry on. And I'm full of joy. I'm forgiven because of Christ. But the point is, confess your sin, repent and find joy. Some of you, I'm not very happy at the moment. And for some of you, it's because actually you've got lots of files on your desktop. Live with a clean desktop before God. Live with, living with unconfessed sin is not nice. Being holy in terms of walking out your holiness isn't somebody who never sins, or they're the goody goodies. They're so pure, they never sin. No, no, that's not it. We all make mistakes. Holiness is learning to deal with your sin quickly. Be quick, diligent, at just confessing sin, repenting. That's how to live in joy. It's living a cross-centered life. Christ takes it, not just like a me-centered wallowing in shame. Um, David, in the Bible, King David, he committed adultery um, and murder on the back of that, of the woman's husband. And he came to a place of repentance in Psalm 51. And he's like, cleanse me, O God. And man, that was a guy who was weeping before God. Cleanse me, cleanse me. But he goes on to say this, restore to me the joy of my salvation. There's something about the process of repentance that God wants us to come to a place of joy. Of joy. Restore to me the joy of salvation. True forgiveness leads to joy. Often you can just sort of like, God, I'm sorry, but not actually receive forgiveness. Not actually receive it in your heart. Not no, not walking away confident is dealt with. Do you follow? Let's be those that trust in the cross and receive forgiveness. So point number two, joy gives us strength. Um, we read out there Ezra saying, hey, guys, stop weeping. It's okay. God's gracious. The joy of the Lord is your strength. What does that mean? Let's have a look. There's something about joy that imparts energy. Joy energizes, doesn't kind of rob us. It's not a draining thing. Have you experienced that? When you're most joyful, you're almost kind of like energetic. It doesn't drain you, it imparts joy. So look, we go through trials, we go through patches of life that are difficult, we go through things that are hard, seasons, days, prolonged trial over months, and life is difficult, it is. Becoming a Christian isn't taking you out of that. It's probably, if anything, walking into it even more so. 
Life is difficult, but through it all we can find joy. The joy that we find in Christ surpasses, goes way deeper than any trial. Um, this last week I was at a conference and I heard a pastor, third world, I won't name the country or the pastor, but this guy is facing serious persecution. Um, in their church, uh, it, he oversees a few churches. One of them is a neighboring town that hated Christians and they all gather together in a rally like we're going to go and kill them. And so they neighbored the village, they went into the village and literally killed family after family, just killed them because they were Christians. And loads of Christians got together and like they were cornered and then they ran into the church, about 150 Christians in the church and they burnt down the church. This is a true story. He's telling me another pastor that he oversees, um, a similar thing, just, just persecution, people hating them. Um, let's see how much detail to give you here. His son was massacred in front of him, and his wife was taken away and was a sex slave for a year and a half. And him and his friends, after a year and a half, they just think pretty dangerous and crazy. They actually went, which is a wonderful redemption story, and, and found her and sneaked her back. And it was just a hugely dangerous thing to do. Um, and she was pregnant with someone's child because she's a Christian. Why am I saying this? Just to shock you and emo- No, no, no. Life's hard. Two things I learned from this was, one, I think my life's hard sometimes. It actually isn't comparative to that. But two, the thing that struck me most. Their faces are so radiant. Oh, I just got up for the acoustic guitar and led these people in worship. They are so passionate for Jesus. They so loved him. They have such a joy on their faces. Just He's amazing, hearing them pray. They found a joy in Christ. They found a joy that no pain, no trial can get to. And just to say, whatever you're walking through today, whatever suffering, the joy that God gives us, the joy that we find in Him, the joy of salvation, goes way deeper than any suffering. And that joy gives us strength. We find the joy in him that surpasses every trial. It says in Philippians 4, verse 8, Rejoice in the Lord, always. Again, I would say, rejoice. Who's writing that? It's a guy in a prison. He's been beaten up and shipwrecked. He's not just like doing really well on a fat salary sitting in a nice comfy chair somewhere. Like, you should rejoice like me. No, he's, he's been through it. He's in a mess. He doesn't say, hey, rejoice in the Lord, except through suffering, because that's hard. You just need to cry and just look at your pain. No, rejoice in the Lord always. Coming from a guy in prison with you know, hardly any food. Rejoice in the Lord always. He's not denying that life's hard. Jesus doesn't deny it's hard. And it's not bad to, to struggle and to find it hard. But in all of that, to come to a place of coming back to him, to his character, to his grace, to who he is. And you read often in the Psalms, just Psalms of real lament. God, I'm finding this hard. Where are you in this? Why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? And Psalms are songs. But they often sing stuff like that. But it's healthy too sometimes. But they often end up in that place of, but still, I will remember your goodness. Still, I remember your faithfulness. When you don't do that, when you just look at your suffering, it's draining. It's exhausting. Disappointment. Disappointment is like somebody puts two holes in your feet and your energy just drains out. Just leaves you. Oh. When you go to God, you lift your eyes to Him, what He's like, His nature. The Christ has taken your sin, the joy of salvation. You find joy gives you strength. Strength for what? Strength to persevere. Strength just to go through another day. You might have to do exactly the same thing the next day but strength to love him, strength to walk on through whatever it is you're walking through. In God, there's joy. There's happiness in it all. So joy gives us strength. Even, I guess, um, like I said earlier, just lots of unconfessed sin, that's just an exhausting thing. That's not a happy soul. You know, if you've got lots of items on your desktop, as it were, that you haven't dealt with, that can just drain you. Some of you today, um, you're weary. 
and going to have 10 hours sleep hasn't shifted it. It actually might be because in your heart, there's some things you haven't repented of. Some of you are weary, um, and again, it's not just you need to put your feet up and relax. Actually, you need to come to God because you've been just looking at how hard things have been. That's been your focus. God would want you to lift your eyes to something far greater, who he is and his goodness towards us. Um, Dave Fellingham used to be an elder in this church. He said to me once, um, when you're tired, go to bed. When you're weary, go to God. So helpful in terms of just finding joy in him. So joy gives us strength. And um, thirdly and finally, just quickly, joy in God's creation. If we go back to uh, Nehemiah 9 verse 10, um, I'll read it to you. It says this, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine. Send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. The day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not be grieved. The joy of the Lord is your strength. But it starts off in verse 10 saying, Eat the fat, drink sweet wine. Enjoying God in his creation. Why on earth are you just saying, go and have a feast? Enjoying God in his creation. Let me explain this to you. I would say two things. One, creation is a gift from God to us that is good and it's to be enjoyed. When God made the world, he said, it is good. It is good. And sometimes we compartmentalize like, spirituality to like Sundays, worship times, that's me being spiritual, and the rest of life isn't spiritual. But actually, when Jesus came to earth, he lived a whole life without sin, yeah? But that means his whole life, he would have been worshiping God, yeah? But he wasn't singing in a worship time his whole life. No, he was having dinner, he was at work. All of that is an opportunity for worship. Eating food and drinking drink is an opportunity just for worship, for thanksgiving. And there's something about being grateful for creation that God wants us to be. Not just that, but to enjoy it, to actually enjoy creation. So it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. It says in 1 Tim 4, verse 4, everything created by God is good. Nothing is to be rejected and received, but received with thanksgiving. It's good. I like to think of it like this. I quite enjoy my food and drink. Um, when it says here, eat the fat, commentary says that word fat in the Hebrew literally means like eat, eat the, the best bit of the meat. Eat the choiciest bit. It's like the fillet steak. It's not actually the fat of the animal. It's like eat the fillet steak. And drink the sweet wine. And the word sweet in the Hebrew is only used, I think, three times in the Old Testament. Another time it's used is around kissing. Like pleasurable wine. Just delicious. So it's like, eat the best meat. Drink the best wine. So when God stood up and said, like, Genesis 1, I've made creation. It is good. He meant the cow. He meant the grapes. Now, Adam had no idea back then. I, I can imagine God being like, you wait. That little bit there in the cow. If you take that, cut it up. Get some olives, squeeze them, get the oil, rub the oil in the meat. If you get some salt, grind it on, some little peppercorn, smash them down, rub it in. If you get a griddle, put it on a high heat for a good five to ten minutes, so it's really high, and about one and a half minutes either side, so the top is crispy, but inside it's still a bit pink. And when you sink your teeth into that, how juicy it is, and tender, and these grapes... Give them a while, press them down, let them ferment, put them in this wood, pour it out, let it breathe. <laughs> you have no idea. Do you think all of that was a mistake? Do you think all of that's just a coincidence? It is good. God is smart. God's given us creation to why? To reject? No, to enjoy. It's common grace. And when, there is, when Israel is kind of reading the law for six hours, realizing how bad they've been, Ezra's like, no, he's gracious, good, stop weeping, okay, get that, repent. The joy of the Lord is your strength, yet yeah, good, now go and feast. There's something about feasting just on food, which is godly. So it says in, um, it says in Ecclesiastes 9, 7 to 8, I'll read it from the message version just because there's something about it which captures the heart of it beautifully. Seize life. Eat bread with gusto. 
Drink wine with a robust heart. Oh yes, God takes pleasure in your pleasure. Dress festively every morning. Don't skimp on colors and scarves. Relish life with the spouse you love. God wants you to enjoy creation. I am as just as spiritual eating a lovely roast lamb and a red wine Amen. than I am right now. <laughs> than I am right now. I'm just as spiritual, and so are you. Yeah. Yet it can become sinful, but if it's done with thanksgiving, if God's the first in your heart, you can enjoy all of these things. Yeah. If these things actually become the first thing, then you need to kill it. But actually, when God's first, you can enjoy a glass of wine. So this isn't an instruction to go and be irresponsible and just get drunk, because Simon said to on Sunday, no, no, no. There's an obedience to God, living with a clear conscience, but enjoy food. Yeah. <laughs> I've got roast lamb for lunch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and just lastly, um, it also says, Nehemiah 9 verse 10, go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, hallelujah, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. Communities gather around food. It's like, hey, no one be left out. Who has none? Make some for them too. Yeah. Food just brings people together. Are you here today and you have none? Are you here today and you have a lot? Share. When Anna and I first got married, we decided that just for a while we would cook for eight people on a Sunday We'd come to church not having invited anybody and we'd just sit there and just pray, God, who, who do you want us to invite over for dinner today? And well, we did it for about six weeks and it was just so much fun. Just like, hey, just talking to somebody, thinking back in my head, I think this could be one. Hey, why don't you come back to ours for lunch? Why don't you come back to ours for lunch? We couldn't do it every week just because I've been involved in leading worship and it didn't work. But there are other ways that we do it now on, with our small group and stuff. Just wanted to gather. Let's be a people that bless each other with food, Yeah. That's not unspiritual. That's worship. This is a gift for us. So, there is joy. Joy in repentance. Joy gives us strength. And joy in creation. Are you a happy person? Jesus has anointed the joy above all of his companions. He was the most joyful person. And he said, my joy I give to you. And so while we take communion, and if the guys want to come up now, um, I've always wanted to say that. I'm always that guy. So it's quite nice. <laughs> Will the musicians come up, please? Yeah. I think there's probably responses in all of these camps. Maybe some of you, you need to come and weep, but just receive forgiveness and just be joyful. Some of you just need strength. And some of you just need to get out of here and cook a great roast dinner. So should we stand to our feet?